A couple of days ago, I had something happen that happens to all of us at different times. Somebody, somebody sent me a link to a video. Got to watch this. Now, sometimes you get a link from a certain person, and you go, not going to watch it, and you just delete it. Sometimes you get a link, and you go, oh, I got to check it. Well, I checked this one out. I watched it like 10 times. It was a, it was a video of a little kid taking, taking his first steps. So he's kind of on the ground. He climbs up on a chair, kind of balances himself, falls again, pulls up again, and then takes a couple steps. That's kind of cute. Ends up losing his balance, goes down to like, like, a, like a weightlifter, down to a full squat here, holds it, keeps it, keeps it, brings it back up again, about three more steps, and then his dad gives him a little treat, and he falls on the ground. <laughs> so well, why would you watch that 10 times? Because that little guy's name is Kel Ryan Harney. He's my grandson, my newest grandchild. I'm the newest grandson, I should say, uh, and just learning to walk. And as I watched that, I was excited. I thought, yeah, that's, I mean, I was, I was cheering him on. He's taking steps forward. Now, if they send me a video when he's five years old and he's just starting to walk or not walking, that's a problem, right? I mean, you, you, it's, it's not like, you know, every, almost every person here, unless you have a unique physical challenge, almost every person here started walking at some point. And most of you walked into the building today, and, and, or if you're at, online, you walked to where you're sitting right now. It's not that big of a deal, but it is a big deal. Each step of growth is a big deal. What you need to understand is that the God who made you and the God who loves you delights in your life as you take steps to become more like Jesus. As you walk towards Jesus, as you walk with Jesus into the world to share his love, God rejoices in the same way that me as a grandpa, I'm watching little Kel, and I'm watching again and again and again, going, this is amazing, he must be the most gifted child in the world. He, he's standing up and walking and falling over, it's amazing, right? Well, it is, because it's, it's, it's a forward step. And that's what Jesus longs for you and me. That's what our Heavenly Father delights in. He's watching you and longs to see you grow. For the next eight weeks, we're talking about uh, organic disciples, an eight-week journey in growing in Jesus and going with Jesus. We'll be talking about two things, growing in Jesus, becoming more like him, walking more closely with him. You know, growing in Jesus is kind of walking with Jesus, but then going with Jesus is following Jesus where he's going. When we take his hand, we follow where he goes. And if you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will discover that Jesus is always going toward the lost, the broken, and the hurting. He came to us when we were lost. And if you're not yet a Christian, he's drawing near to you even now. Like Pastor Ryan said, if you're not a Christian, you're like, I'm not even sure why I'm here. Well, God knows why you're here. His arms are open. He's saying, come to me. So we're going to talk about growing in Jesus, growing up in our faith, discipleship, and going with Jesus, following him on his mission in this world, evangelism, and how these things connect together. And, and so I, I just want to welcome you to this experience, and I want to I show you from the word of God why this is so critical. Look with me, if you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. And Ephesians chapter 4, the apostle Paul is writing to the church of Ephesus, and he's, he's teaching them about a lot of things, but he's teaching them about spiritual growth, about us as believers and us as a church. So in Ephesians chapter 4, Beginning in verse 13, I want you to notice just the seriousness of, of this and, and where God is taking us with these words. The Apostle Paul is saying to ordinary Christians like you and me, just people who love Jesus, want to follow him. He's saying until we reach unity in faith, our faith is united, and in knowledge of the Son of God, there's an understanding of what we believe, our doctrine, the truth of the word. Until we all, all of us, not just some, not just pastors and special people, all of us, till we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature. Mature Christians. Just like I'm watching little Kel, delighting that he's taking steps because he's maturing physically, he's growing. God's watching us saying, grow up in your faith. Become all that I want you to be. And become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That line right there has captured me since I was first a Christian. I grew up in a non-believing home. When I became a Christian, I read the Bible. When I came to that attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. The version I memorized it in was, was, the, was the RSV. And, and, it, and it was a different wording, but it's, it's like locked in my mind. The whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Here's a question for you. If you're a Christian, are you there yet? Have you arrived to the, is the whole measure of the fullness of Christ matured in you? It hasn't in me yet. It hasn't in, in Pastor Ryan. We're, we're not there. We're on this journey of growth. And if you feel like you've arrived, this is going to be a great eight weeks, to, eight weeks to discover how to keep moving forward and growing up in faith. The whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then, 
Then we will no longer be infants, spiritual babies, tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. There's a lot of deceitful scheming in our world. There's a lot of false teaching in our world, not just in the church, but in the world, in culture. How do we know how to live? How do we know how to walk? How do we know who to be? By knowing the word of God and holding to it and walking in it and growing in our faith. And then, and then as we mature in faith, we're not, the, you know, the winds of teaching, you know, it's like, well, how, what, what's a marriage supposed to look like? What's a man? What's a woman? How do, we, how do we relate with people who disagree with us? Every question in life is answered in the scriptures. And as we mature in faith, all of a sudden the winds of culture or the winds of false teaching hit us and they don't push us off. Why? We know what we believe. And over these eight weeks, I hope and pray you get a clearer picture of what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus. If you're not a Christian yet, you will stay here for the eight weeks. Keep coming. If you're online, keep coming online. And find out what it actually says. Well, maybe someday I'll become a Christian. What does that mean? What does a follower of Jesus look like? We're going to come to understand that in a really rich way in the coming weeks. And so, over these weeks, I want to encourage you to jump in. I want to encourage you, at the end of the message, I'm going to talk about a tool that we've created that you can do a self-assessment of, of how you're doing your spiritual growth and get some ideas for next steps. I want to encourage you to read the scriptures to, to read and to learn and say, I want to grow in what it means to be a disciple. So today, this morning, what I want to do is I want to answer three, what I call three epic questions. Three really big questions about what it means to grow in Jesus, discipleship, and go with Jesus. Evangelism, sharing our faith. And these three questions become the foundation for all we're going to talk about. If you miss the foundation, you're in trouble. If you're, those of you that are builders, if you try to build a house and you haven't created a solid foundation, you know what's going to happen. It's a mess. If you're in farming, if you don't prepare the soil... You're not going to have a good harvest. In every aspect of life, there's foundational things that have to be done. This is the foundation of the next eight weeks. This is the foundation of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. So keep your ears and your heart open to see what God wants to say to you. Question number one. Well, three questions this morning. Question number one. How can I know I'm growing as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus? How can I know that I'm growing? Now, if someone came to you and said, hey, are you growing in your faith? Most people are going to go, uh, yeah, thanks for asking. Um, this is awkward. No, most, we don't ask each other that, but say, are you, are you growing as a disciple? Are you growing in your faith? Most of us will go, well, I go to church, and I love Jesus, and I, got, I own a Bible, and I read it sometimes. I mean, I, how, how do you know? How do you know you're growing up in faith? Uh, in, in our home, when our, our three, three sons, when our boys were growing up, uh, we had a spot where we would kind of put a, you know, have them stand, put a ruler, and put a little hash mark and show as they were getting taller. Sherry did that just recently with, uh, with one of our grandkids here. We, they were, he was talking about how tall he was and how big he was, and Sherry had him stand up and put a little hash mark. Now, if you put a little hash mark of where a child is, and say maybe it's, maybe it's a five-year-old child, you put it, okay, they're this tall. And then the next year you mark, and they're here, and the next year they're here. You go, oh, this, you see the growth. You're excited. If you put a hash mark here when they're five, and now they're seven, they stand there, and they're the exact same height. And when they're nine, they're the same height. And when they're 11, they're an inch shorter. You figured out something, Right? You're going to say, something's not right here. Things are supposed to naturally grow. Well, God is looking at us saying, you need to understand that growing up in faith is important. So how do you know it's happening? That's our first question. And listen to these words from Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. Because the first thing that we have to understand to be growing spiritually in maturity, how do I know I'm growing to be a, more of a disciple, more like Jesus, is when the fruit of God's spirit is growing in me. When the fruit of the spirit is just naturally increasing in my life. Galatians 5.22 says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and last but definitely not least, self-control. Against such things there is no law. These fruit of the Spirit Mark our lives. Sherry and I describe it this way. We talk about, when we talk to people about the fruit of the Spirit, we say it's like an umbrella that covers your whole spiritual life, all that you do, all that you are. The fruit of the Spirit have to be there to cover everything because if you start doing Christian-type stuff, but they're not full of love and kindness and gentleness, it can get really ugly. What, what, what do you mean by that? Here's what I mean. In Jesus' days, there was this group called the Pharisees. The Pharisees followed all the rules. They knew the Bible really, really well. 
They prayed so well it impressed everybody. When it came to giving their offerings, the Pharisees would go, if they had a garden and they had a little plant come up and they had a little bit of some spice and there was like four or five leaves of that spice, they would take those four or five leaves, they'd dry it, they'd chop it up and they would take exactly one-tenth of that little bit and they'd, fold, and they'd bring it to the temple to give it. They gave a tenth of everything. But their hearts were wrong. They did the right behaviors, but their spirit and their heart was in the wrong place. And do you know how Jesus felt about that? Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and see how he interacted with these guys. They were doing all the right things with the wrong spirit. This is why the fruit of the spirit have to be the umbrella over your spiritual life. You should be filled with love and joy and peace, kindness, self-control. All of the fruits of this, all nine of the fruits of the spirit mark your life. And then they guide how you live out your life. They guide how you read the scriptures, how you pray, how you grow in faith. Because you can pray really good and read the scriptures really well and give a lot and have your heart far from Jesus. So we start here with the fruit of the Spirit. That's the first thing. So just quietly in your own heart, just say, Lord Jesus, today, this day, will you grow the fruit of the Spirit in a fresh new way inside of me? I don't want to be just this religious person who knows how to go through the motions, but my heart is not gentle. My words are not kind. Self-control isn't guiding me. Jesus, will you grow the fruit of the Spirit in my life? Over these eight weeks, let me pay attention to this, and over the rest of my life, grow your fruit in me. For your glory, Jesus, and for my good. Amen. Keep praying that prayer. Keep growing the fruit of the Spirit. But then, as the fruit of the Spirit grows, then we talk about what are the ingredients of spiritual maturity. How do I know I'm growing in spiritual maturity? What you see in front of you here is just, there's, there's these seven little pictures that are kind of reminders that, that we created to kind of remind us of these core seven things. What we did was about, oh gosh, was seven or eight years ago, we spent an entire year studying Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, and I, I gathered with my uh, churches, I'm a local church pastor in, in California, with our children's leaders, our youth leaders, our women's leaders, men's leaders, all, a board, and we had people representing all of our key ministries of the church. And we met over a year's time asking this question, how do we know when a person is growing in spiritual maturity? How do we know? Is there a way we can assess ourselves and see how we're doing? And after a year, we came up with seven different things that out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the life of Jesus, we saw these things in Jesus and believe that Jesus calls us to live like him. A disciple is someone who's becoming more and more like Jesus. They're following Jesus more closely. Well, how did he live? What did he do? What did he model for us for our lives? And so here's the seven things that we came up with. And honestly, I think if any of you spent a year studying the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and said, what did Jesus do that he calls us to do? You'd come up with the same things. It's not, it's not revolutionary in the terms of new. It's just going to the scriptures and seeing what God has to say. So here they are. Here's the seven ingredients of a maturing Christian life. Bible engagement. We start there. And with our children at our church, when we did this, we taught them what we do is, is we, we know, we love, and we follow the Bible. Those three words. Know it, love it, follow it. Children and adults. Bible engagement is knowing, loving, and following what the Bible teaches. That's growing in your life. I'm growing in my love for the word, my knowledge of the word, following the word. Okay, I'm growing up as a Christian. I can see on the little hash mark on the wall. I'm getting taller. I'm growing up, right? Here's the next one. Passionate prayer. That we talk with Jesus more, not just by ourselves, with other people. You know, we talk with Jesus when we're with friends and, and we pray about things together. In our home, in the workplace, at our school, prayer becomes part of our lives. Passionate prayer is growing. I know I'm growing up in faith when passionate prayer is growing. Wholehearted worship. Worship that is passionate and connected with the heart of God. As we were working on this over this whole year, we originally had, we had um, prayer and worship as one marker. And it was my wife, Sherry, in the conversation that said, I think those are distinctly different. And this is why we worked. We worked to spend a year. So she said, I think that prayer is, is a way that we're talking with God. Worship is a part of that, but worship is praising God, celebrating God. And so, so we actually, we and really looked at the teaching of Jesus and realized that there's something about worship that's distinct. And so it is my heart wholeheartedly worshiping, not just on Sunday mornings in church, but all week long. The Apostle, the, the Apostle Paul talks about how, how we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to God, holy and pleasing, all that we are. This is your spiritual act of worship all week long, all you do, giving your life to God. So wholehearted worship is part of we, how we know we're growing as a Christian. Humble service. You cannot read the Gospels and look at Jesus and not see Jesus leaving the glory of heaven, coming humbly in a manger for us to serve us, washing feet, caring for the broken, 
So we as his followers say, I need to grow. How do I know I'm, how do I know I'm growing as a disciple? Humble service is becoming more of my life. It's not, oh, you do it and I'll receive it. It's we'll do it together and glorify Jesus. We're growing in humble service. That's another marker. Joyful generosity. All through the scriptures and through the gospels, we see the spirit of generosity. Not just generosity, but actually joyful generosity. We're not just called as Christians to be generous. We're called to do it with a smile on our faces. There's a guy in the church I serve right now who came to me a couple years back, and he said, um, he said, Pastor, I want to learn how to give. I don't, I don't like giving. I don't really give, but I know that God wants me to give. Can you teach me about giving? Sure. So we met a couple times. We talked. We prayed. And as we were talking, he actually said to me, okay, so, so I understand that God wants, to, you know, God wants me to give the, the first of what I have, my first 10%. I understand I live everything with open hands. But he said, like, so if I give to my alma mater, the college I went to, does that count? I said, what school did you go to? He told me. I said, nope. And so uh, <laughs> I, said, I said, it might have, might have counted 150 years ago at that school, but not anymore. Uh, and, um, and then he said, what if I give to this or that kind of, kind of political causes? And I said, this is really about giving to the work of Jesus and the gospel. Now, there's things that might overlap, but really it's about giving to the work of Jesus. So a couple of years have gone by, and I was talking to him not long ago. And I, and I, I said, hey, how's that going for you? And how are you doing? Growing? He said, I'm growing to be consistent, doing it really faithfully. I said, are you joyful yet? He says, nope. <laughs> but I'm doing it. I said, okay. I said, keep, keep moving forward. But he was just honest. He said, I'm not like going, woo, but I'm being faithful. But there's that journey of growth, right? Consistent community is another marker. How do I know I'm growing up in my faith? Because I love to be with the people of God. At my home for a dinner or a barbecue. At my backyard, at a park somewhere, in church together like this, that being together as a family. This is something that, that, that the enemy is trying to break down right now, the church gathering. But being together as a family. All, any way you can have community with God's people, that's part of God's call. How do I know I'm growing up in faith? I'm learning to love the community of God's people. And then the seventh one is organic outreach. That's the term we use for naturally sharing our faith. How do I know I'm growing up to be more like Jesus? I'm following Jesus into the world on his mission. I'm shining his light. I'm scattering the seed. I'm living in such a way that my life is so salty, it makes people thirst for what only Jesus, the living water of heaven, can satisfy. As I'm, as I'm walking more closely with Jesus, I walk with him into the world that he loves. And I become his person in this world, his ambassador in this world. All seven of those are aspects of our spiritual growth. How do I know I'm growing up in faith? Well, the fruit of the Spirit, like an umbrella, is covering all of my life, and then I'm growing in passionate prayer and biblical engagement, consistent community. I'm growing in these things. You'll spend a week on each of these coming up, and you'll dig into these, but I'm growing in each of those areas. So here's a distinction I want to make for you. What's the difference between a menu and a recipe? A menu and a recipe. Here's the main difference. On a menu, you pick what you want. On a recipe, everything is needed. So, th so when I first met Sherry, first time I went to visit her grandmother, her, uh, who, was, who was just a sweet lady, she was always in the kitchen cooking, always had an apron on, always in the kitchen cooking. Matter of fact, she had a stroke, so she could only use half of her body, so all of her kids would be there helping her. She still loved to cook. And she passed on her recipe for chocolate chip cookies to Sherry. So if I said to you, hey, I got a recipe I want to give you. For, for the best, if you, I mean, you've talked about it, right out of the oven with a cold glass of milk. It's not heaven, but man, it's close. It's good, right? And so if I said, I, here's the recipe, and you go home, you make the cookies, you come back and you say, they're terrible. I didn't like them at all. I mean, I've never had anybody try one of her grandma's chocolate cookies and not like it. Well, so tell me how you made them. Well, I started getting the ingredients together, and I, I didn't have any chocolate chips, and so I put in raisins, you know? And I didn't, I didn't have walnuts, so I put in slivers of almond. And I ran out of sugar, so I just put a little extra salt. And I don't like them at all. I don't like her grandma's chocolate chip cookies. I'm going to tell her, you've never tried her grandmother's chocolate chip cookies. You're using the wrong ingredients. You need all the ingredients to make a recipe, right? So here's the thing. These seven markers of spiritual growth, they're not a menu. You don't get to go, I like biblical engagement. I like passionate prayer. I'm not so big on community, and I don't like that joyful generosity. You don't get to choose. To have a mature Christian life, you need all the ingredients. Following me? It's a recipe that Jesus gives us to have a delicious, wonderful, fantastic Christian life. And, and, and so, so to the first question, how can I know I'm growing as a disciple? You simply say, okay, are the fruit of the Spirit growing in my life? Kindness and gentleness, self-control in all that I do. And then am I growing 
in the things that Jesus modeled and says, this is part of your life as my follower. These are the ingredients. And if those things are happening, you can see those little hash marks from the wall. I'm growing in faith. You'll feel it. You'll see it. And other people will see it. Your spouse will see it. Your friends will see it. You'll be growing up in faith and becoming more and more like Jesus. Question number two. Is discipleship bigger than my relationship with Jesus? Is discipleship bigger than just, I love Jesus, Jesus loves me, I read the Bible, I pray. I, you know, is, is, is my discipleship more than just kind of my walk with Jesus? And most Christians, if you ask them what is discipleship, they will say, well, it's, it's how I read my Bible, how I pray, how I'm growing in faith. And that's part of it. But I think when some people look at what is a disciple, they think they get it. They think, I, I nailed it, I understand, I got it. And I think we don't. I think we, have, we don't have the full picture. Have any of you seen any of those memes, those nailed it memes? A, a meme is just like a picture that has kind of a little, little kind of fun message to it. And so I, I brought some of these together. Of these, they're called nailed it. These are people who are doing something they think is exactly right, nailed it, but they've kind of missed it. So I want you to imagine a guy going in to get a tattoo on his shoulder. He hold, gives the picture. The guy says, this is what I want. So look at this. He says, this is what I want, this beautiful Pegasus there. And look at the tattoo artist. This is what he got. And the tattoo artist, tattoo artist says, nailed it. But when the guy goes home and looks at it in the mirror, he's not saying nailed it. He says, I'm going to nail it. Anyways, I'm going to deal with you, right? Uh, but so imagine a, a mom on Instagram. She sees a picture that somebody uses as their Christmas card, like a digital Christmas card. They go, oh, I'm going to do the same thing with my kids. So this wonderful, wonderful picture here. Somebody's out there, you know, smiley babies. So then they try to duplicate that, okay? And this is what they come up with. <laughs> Say it with me. Ready? Nailed it, right? No, <laughs> missed it is the truth. Imagine somebody, a, a dad says, I'm tired of these expensive uh, uh, ice cream treats. I'm going ma to make the kids some ice cream treats my own way. So he tries to duplicate this. So here it is. You've got the ice cream treat there, and he's going to reproduce it, and it's just creepy. And so, uh, <laughs> all right. But, but the, da the dad explains to his wife, I just nailed it. I got it. This is fine. They'll love it, right? This one scared me a little bit. Uh, this is a cake that somebody tried to duplicate. Take a look at this. Have all the kids come over, enjoy this scary, creepy thing. <laughs> Nailed it. And this is my favorite one. This is my favorite one. A kid comes to their parents and says, um, I want to be Aquaman. I want to be this guy right here. So show us Aquaman there. I want to be Aquaman for, for Halloween. That's what I want to do. So the parents are farmers. They say, well, we can fashion something for you. This is a real picture, by the way. Show us what we came up with. There you go. <laughs> so <laughs> this, is, this is husks of... of um, What's it, what's it called? Pineapple, corn on the cob, green leaves. It's, and I don't know if these are tamales or what, but it's just, it's, uh, it's, it's beautiful. But, and say, everybody say it with me. You ready? Yeah. Nailed it, right? Well, maybe not. So is discipleship more, let's make that go away. Whatever's next, we'll go to the next one. <laughs> Thank you. Is discipleship more than just me and Jesus? Well, we say, we, we say discipleship is me. I love Jesus. I worship. I read my Bible. I pray. I'm growing as a disciple. And so I nailed it, but maybe not. Maybe there's more. And so listen to these words, because the reality is discipleship is always, always four generations. We think of it as me and Jesus, one generation, me with Jesus. But the Bible says discipleship, true maturing in faith, is always four generations walking together in faith. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says this. The Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy, who's a pastor, his protege, somebody he's discipling, and he's a pastor in the city of Ephesus. And Paul writes, and the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, Paul says to Timothy, the things you've heard me say, the things I've taught you, the things I've instructed you, and the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, you, Timothy, entrust to reliable people, a next generation, right? Entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to do what? Teach others also. So here's what Paul says. Paul says, Timothy, your journey of spiritual growth looks like this. Here's Timothy. Paul says, I'm holding your hand. I'm helping you grow. I'm helping you mature in faith. Paul's pouring to Timothy. Timothy's stewarding his own spiritual growth. He's in the word. He's praying. He's growing in his faith. But Timothy also is expected to take the hands of reliable people who he can help them grow in faith. And as he's doing that, he's teaching them how to do it with somebody else. You get the picture? And that's how you became a Christian and how I became a Christian. Somebody, probably a lot of somebody's, came along and took your hand. Some pastor, some grandparent, some parent, some neighbor, some friend. And they took your hand. They helped you grow in faith. Are we going to take someone else's hand and help them grow in faith and teach them to do the same? 
I think of Sherry's life growing up. Sherry grew up in a strong Christian home, Fourth Reformed Church in Holland, Michigan. Her dad, Sherwin, her mom, uh, Joan, just the sweetest people, loved Jesus. Sherry grew up in hundreds of different things and thousands of different times seeing people live for Jesus. Her parents would take their hands. They prayed as a family. They talked as a family. Faith was there. They worshiped as a family. Her parents took her hand and helped her grow. But Sherry didn't just say, okay, now I'm a Christian. This is great. She takes the hands of other people. There's a young woman who's part of our church in, in California named Kaylee. And Kaylee came to Sherry and asked Sherry if she would kind of be a mentor for her and kind of spiritually help her grow in faith. And Sherry's been doing that for about a year and a half. She's been helping Kaylee, taking her hand and helping her grow in faith. But while Sherry's been doing that, Sherry's teaching Kaylee how to reach out to others. Now Kaylee is working with about a dozen high school girls in the church I serve where she's reaching down to them and helping them grow in their faith. And, she, and someday they will do the same for someone else, Right? So these 12 young high school girls that are growing in faith because of Kaylee's impact should say, thank you, Jesus, for Sherwin and Joan Vleem. Because their faith has been passed on from generation to generation, sometimes blood generation and family, and we need to have that family faith, absolutely. But sometimes outside the family, just the church family. But we take, so, so here's, here's the question I have for you. Is discipleship more than just me and Jesus? The answer is yes. It's four generations. I have men in my life right now who are taking my hand and helping me grow in faith. Carl Overbeek, and, and I've, I, I, he is a retired pastor who's been pouring into my life for years and years and years. Paul Cedar, retired, I think, from being a pastor for like 20 years. But every month, I spend time with them, and they take my hand. You say, well, Kevin, you're a grandpa. You got four grandkids. You need someone to help you grow in faith? Yes, I do. And those men do that on a regular basis. Generation to generation to generation. And if you think this is just sort of a, well, that's, this is a New Testament thing, Apostle Paul thing, listen to these words. Um, uh, li listen to these words from Psalm 78. This is Old Testament now. And if you have your own Bible, and if you're a note taker, notice the four generations in this passage. Same thing, four generations. Psalm 78, verse 5. He, God, decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel which he commands our, commanded our ancestors to teach their children. So you know the word, you know the truth, you teach your children, right? To teach their children. So that the next generation would know them. And even the children yet to be born, their children. And they in turn will tell their children. Get it? Four generations. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. Is discipleship bigger than just me and Jesus, Jesus and me? The answer is yes. So if someone says to you, are you growing in your faith? Are you growing as a disciple? Stop and think. Do I have people helping me grow in faith still? Well, I'm in my 60s, 70s, 80s, but you still can. Do I have somebody that I'm helping grow in faith in some way? And am I teaching them how to do the same with the next generation? That's how Christianity will continue until Jesus returns. And if we don't take that seriously... It, that generational faith in the family or in the spiritual family or with friends can go away if we're not faithful to that calling. Question number three. What is the relationship between discipleship and evangelism? What's the relationship between growing in Jesus, discipleship, and going with Jesus into the world with his love and grace, evangelism? What's the connection? What's the relationship? Well, some people look at discipleship in a very, very kind of narrow way. Let's say, well, discipleship is only one person spending time with somebody like four days a week and pouring into them and really, and, and, you know, kind of mentoring them. And, and it, they have a very rigid kind of view of it. And I'd say, yeah, that's discipleship. One person really heavily pouring into another person. But I would say discipleship is any time any Christian helps another person take a next step towards Jesus. Whether they're coming towards Jesus to receive him or whether they're walking in growth in their faith. When a grandmother teaches her grandchildren to pray. She's discipling them. She's teaching them to grow in faith. When a parent sits down with their child and reads the Bible and teaches them the scriptures, they're discipling their child because they're taking their hand and helping them grow to know and walk with Jesus. When a friend talks to another friend about how to grow in faith and how to walk with Jesus, that's discipleship. Discipleship can happen in thousands of different ways. And, and, and discipleship and evangelism are clearly connected together. In Matthew chapter 28... In Matthew 28, Jesus has died on the cross. He's risen again in glory. He's about to ascend to heaven. And he's giving final instructions to his followers. And I want you to listen to this passage, and you tell me in your own mind, you answer this. 
Is Jesus talking about evangelism, leading people to Jesus, or discipleship, growing people in their faith so they can go out and, and love people in the name of Jesus? Is Jesus talking about discipleship and evangelism, or evangelism and discipleship? What's he talking about? Which one of those two things? Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And Jesus says, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. When Jesus is speaking these words, is he talking about reaching people with the gospel or growing people in their faith? And the answer is both. They're connected together more closely than we recognize. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Non-believers who become Christians and they get baptized, and then teach them all that I've commanded you. So I want you to look at this diagram for a minute here. And this picture is one that I think is, is helpful. Uh, Sherry and I have designed this to kind of help people figure out the journey of faith for people. Minus 20 is a hardcore atheist. My, when I, became a, when, when I was, uh, became a Christian, my dad was probably a minus 17. I got to watch my dad walk from being highly resistant and, and not believing at all to coming to being very open to the gospel, to coming to be very interested and curious, to praying to receive Jesus, to growing to probably about a two or a three in first steps of growth, and about a month after he became a Christian, he passed away. He fought it for a long, long time. But I got to see him, I've seen other people come from here, and they become a believer, and they're growing and maturing in faith, and you're here where you're sharing faith and reaching out and loving others, but this is the journey, they're, they're connected together. So the relationship of discipleship and evangelism, Sherry and I kind of use this little saying and I think it's a very helpful one. How do these relate to each other? So here's, here's the first thing. Evangelism and discipleship are not enemies. Some people look at that, they're like, well, you know, we're, we're a discipleship church. We're an evangelism church. What? Are you a biblical church? Then you're both, right? They're not enemies. They're not rivals. Evangelism and discipleship are not just friends. They're not just like kind of pals. They kind of hang out. They're buddies, you know. No, no, no. Evangelism and discipleship are marriage partners. And what God has joined together, when the two become one, let no one tear apart. You cannot do discipleship and grow people in faith without them going to share the love of Jesus. Why? Because when you grow up in faith, you walk with Jesus, and Jesus goes to those that are lost. He came to you when you were lost. He came to me. He wants you to go with him. And you can't do evangelism and reach the lost without helping them grow up in faith. Two sides of the same coin. They go together. And every time we help another person take a next step closer to Jesus... This is discipleship. Every time you help someone take a next step, whether, whether they're, they're not a believer coming close. When my, dad, when my dad went from being a non-believer to a believer, and Sherry and I were with him and prayed with him that day, it was an amazing moment. But you know what else was amazing? The probably 100 plus times that we prayed with my dad before he was a Christian. And one time after probably 15 years, Whenever, whenever I was with my dad, I'd say, Dad, can I pray for you? And the first, first, first time I asked him, he'd go, couldn't hurt. I said, okay. And we prayed. And eventually I'd just say, Dad, can I pray for you? And he'd say, sure. And I remember about, about, about 15 years of praying with him whenever I was with him. I remember the first time at the end of the prayer, he said, amen. I said to Sherry afterwards, did you hear that? He said, amen. I was like, you go, well, what's the big deal? He never said amen. He never, he, he, he entered in. I remember the first time when I finished my prayer for him. And he tagged on a little prayer at the end. He actually threw in a little prayer at the end of my prayer. Next step. And I remember the day that he prayed and confessed his sin and became a Christian. And started that journey of growth. Discipleship and evangelism are this process. And we're part of all of, both of them all the time. That's part of our journey of faith, of walking with Jesus. I call this the journey of a lifetime. It is, a, it is a lifetime, lifelong journey of walking with Jesus, of growing in faith, of coming to know him, and then walking in faith and moving forward with Jesus. So I want to, before I pray for you, I want to give you one encouragement. I want to encourage you, this week you'll get an email from the office that'll have a link to a self-assessment. You can click on that link, or you can go on the website, and there's one, for, there's one for adults, and there's one for students. So parents, do this with your kids. Have each of them do it. And when you open it, when you open it and you click on that, you're going to get something here. Go, go forward, I think, two slides maybe. Yeah, right there. It's going to come up like this. And it's going to, be, it's going to, have a, it's going to make a statement. And then it says, never true of me, always true of me. You can say one is never, you know, kind of sometimes, maybe. You know, and you just go one, two, three, four, five, never true of me, always true of me. And you click on each of those. When you're done and you submit it, within about three or four seconds, 
The system will send back to you all your results, to you personally, not to the church, not to anybody else, just come right back to you, and also resources for all seven areas of growth. So if you look at you and say, I'm really strong in Bible engagement, I'm really strong in prayer, thank you, Jesus. Man, I'm really low in community, and I'm really low in wholehearted worship. Then there'll be about a page and a half of ideas of how to grow in those areas, and you can design your own personal growth plan. I know that the church here has lots of resources to help you grow spiritually, but this can get you a sense of where you need to grow to be, you know, which, which of the ingredients in, your re- in this recipe of your spiritual life are kind of missing right now that need to be increased. Got to sprinkle a little bit more of that in there. Got to pour some more of that in there. I challenge you to do that, use that self-assessment tool. Do it today if you can. It'll, it'll take you probably 14 to 18 minutes, but it can have a huge impact on your life. And then over the next seven weeks, just keep your heart open. Just pray this prayer. Pray it with me right now. Lord, I'm ready for my next step of growth. I'm ready to take another step toward you. I may be a brand new Christian, but I want to to grow in faith. I may may have been a Christian for 70 or 80 years, but I still have growth, Jesus, that needs to happen in my life. Will you grow me over these eight weeks? Will you teach me what it means to be a disciple? to walk with you, Jesus, to fall in love with you in a fresh new way. Jesus, this is our prayer. Help us take our next step toward you. And not to take that step alone, but walking with others. And right now as we sing this song together, I'm gonna invite you to stand. If you're able to stand, would you stand right now? And make this a prayer. And be just saying to the Lord during this song, be saying, Lord, help me grow. I'm ready for my next step. Lord, lead me forward. Let's worship together.